Hello, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to our Red Letter Study. And then, like I said last time, sit down, get ready to put on your thinking caps for the greatest sermon ever preached and yet another difficult passage, which is says things that bring into question um, who is he talking to and what is he saying to them. So we need to remind ourselves how it all started. Jesus presenting a disciple. He is one who is blessed because he recognizes wretchedness and seeks out for righteousness in a world of persecution, which makes them delight in the salt. And that's when Jesus turns back to himself. And how he came not to abolish the law, to unhook the law, to change the law, but to fulfill it. And even when he speaks about the commandment that we're supposed to present, he uses, again, a word that speaks of a fulfillment of commandment, the goal of the commandments. And that's what we're supposed to understand and preach when we talk about God's law, prophets, commandments. It's about pointing to something specific found in Christ. So that's when he tells them, your righteousness must surpass those of the Pharisees. They're supposed to understand that can happen. Yet, There'll probably be some among the crowd, including Pharisees, saying, yeah, I get that. I get, I get that righteousness. And that's when Jesus moves to the law. Again, he's not changing it. He's not destroying it. He's going to explain it in greater details. And that's when he's going to show your righteousness might not be that good. The next couple of sections, it's all about him taking the law, going deeper into it, and showing them their righteousness is not greater than those of the Pharisees, even if they're Pharisees. And then you, they do need to recognize that spiritual poverty to then turn to Christ. But I digress, because once he's pointed that out, you realize who he's talking to. He's talking to the crowd. He's talking to all those who are not disciples, who haven't realized that he's the Savior, when the doctor that they need. But it doesn't end there, because that's not all he says. He's also going to bring it home and apply the greater depth of the law and that's when we want to be careful, but we'll get to it in time. We want to begin with, well, the truth. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment. Take note of how Jesus presents this. He could have just said the law says. He could have specifically said the, the which book, right? Deuteronomy or uh, Exodus says, but, but he doesn't. He says, you've heard it, it was said to those of old. Sounds like the telephone game, right? You heard about them hearing something, that they heard something, that heard something. Except this telephone game is the right kind of telephone game, where the truth keeps getting passed along. I mean, even within the law, there was this idea that this, this, this generation who heard the law from Moses was supposed to pass it on to their kids. And then so forth and so on until it goes all the way to now. And just like Paul saying to Timothy, this good deposit, the gospel, the, the truth, the doctrines I gave you, you pass it on to the next generation. And they'll, they'll do the same thing. And that's what I'm hearing by the way Jesus presents it. He's reminding them you, you've received it from, from ear to ear to ear to ear, generation after generation. That's the way it's supposed to be. And all about one of the commandments. Murder. And, and take note, it's murder, not kill. It, it, it's, it's a little detail, but it's important. Murder is um, a specific kind of taking of a life that is against the law. It's one that's non-justifiable, not acceptable in God's eye. Because you, you could take a life to punish a killer. You could, you could take a life for earn specific sins. You could, for, for, for war. But other types any other types that couldn't be justified by the law is murder. It's when it comes from the heart of hate, as he will clearly uh, soon show us. But then he, he, he tells them that they're liable to judgment. Well, if, if you've ever read the Ten Commandments, you know he doesn't say that right away. Actually, there's no specific place in the law that says they'll be liable to judgment. This is more of a combination of ideas where, yes, um, according to what God shared to them, the commandments, there was supposed to be a judgment and then punishment. Actually, a better way would have just been they should have been punished by death. That that was the more clear teaching. Those who murdered must die. Point, plan. That's it. 
But Jesus says, no, they're liable to judgment. Because like I said, it was included in the law, but I think there's something more going on here. Just take note of it right now, that that's where he goes with it. They're liable to judgment, which equals to punishment. Because now that he said that, he's going to go deeper, and that's when he's going to strike in the very sacred heart and say, but I say to you, that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. Or Gehenna fire, more precise. Um, so here's Jesus, not, again, uh, uh, destroying the law, or abolishing it, or modifying it, by saying, I say, but already having explained, I'm not here to destroy it, but to fulfill it, to bring it to its fruition, to explain the depth of it, I'm going to do that now. And tell you it's not about the physical act of murder, it's about the evil intent to murder. Right? Because the angry speaks of is one that's deeply rooted, that's, that, that, that's long-lasting, that's fire burning slowly but continually. That is the kind of anger, he says, is just as liable to judgment, same judgment, right? Same punishment. Then he, he says other things that has brought a lot of people to speculate that there's levels of 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 um, of way to be angry, levels of of anger that's acceptable, and then there's uh, greater punishment for certain things you might say. But I don't think that's the goal here. I, I believe that Jesus is using synonyms in repetition. We see that a lot in Scripture. Paul does that a lot. Using synonyms to repeat itself and to say to the same thing with greater emphasis. And we have precedent that Jesus does that, like in John 21, when he's restoring Peter. People get a, again, they misunderstand what's going on here. When Paul said, when Jesus says, um, Peter, do you love me, agape? And Peter says, I love you, filio, brotherly affection. And ho, how quickly we go, oh, Jesus is saying perfect love and John and Peter is only saying normal love. No, 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 no. They're synonyms. See, first of all, agape love wasn't even used that much back then. And filial love, brotherly affection, was far deeper. It really meant like you're, you, you, I can see you're my brother. You're my family. I'll do anything for you. I'll die for you. But there's still synonyms for them. Agape, sacrificial love, and uh, a brotherly love was for them just as equal. And it continues though, because then Jesus says, feed my flock and feed my lamb. The, the two words feed are actually different in the Greek. And you can even hear it in lamb and sheep, two different animals. That, does it mean that there's two types of disciples and two ways to feed them? No, synonyms. Repeating similar words to say the same basic thing, care for my flock. Well, when you come back here, you see it. First of all, there's that area of insults. Raka in the Greek, which means rockhead, empty head, idiot. Well, when you want us to fool, more, which we get the word moron from, again means idiot. So it's different ways of saying idiot. Which is why when we get to the judgment part, we shouldn't try to make it worse. Um, the council, Sanhirin is the word here, you, you probably know that word, right? The Sanhedrin, the group of elders, is when we come back to what I was saying before. They have put themselves in the seat of Moses, as Jesus condemns in John. They put themselves in that place of rulership that they could interpret the law of Moses the way they want. We decide how you should apply the, the law and how you should punish. And I, I think this is tongue in cheek, Jesus kind of pointing at it when he says it in the, in the first verse and says it again here. Like, my oath of judgment, well, when I the consul, these people. But basically the idea is, you should be punished. And what is God is going to say about that kind of anger? God's going to say, you deserve hell. You deserve eternal punishment. Because that's what it's all about. It's saying that this anger is like murder, and in murder, your life is taken, and God also takes away your eternal life. It's, it's saying the same thing. It's really showing how 
there is a greater depth to what God's law was saying, and basically nobody's righteousness is greater than the Pharisees. But Jesus won't end here. He's not just going to stop at this notion of, okay, your righteousness is not that good. He's also going to apply it. And this is where, as I've said, we're going to be careful because we're too quick to forget he's speaking to this Jewish crowd. Not disciples, Jewish crowd. He's talking about their way of life, and you see it in what he says next. So, so, or therefore, shows us he's going to apply what he's just taught us. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, um, as Christians, we don't go to the altar. We don't go to the temple. We don't sacrifice animals anymore. And that's something that the first believers had difficulty with, right? But we see in the book of Acts how sometimes even Paul went to the temple to offer sacrifices. He, it was hard for him to break away from the idea that it's not what disciples of Jesus do anymore. Hebrews is clear now that this, this is over. So, yeah, that's not specifically for Christians. doesn't mean you can apply it. It's just we have to be careful. Who is Jesus talking to? But what he's saying does apply. And take note that he doesn't speak of your anger towards people. He started with your anger, but then moves on to other people's anger towards you. He said, if that's the case, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. This reminds me of what Samuel tells Saul. That God wants obedience more than sacrifices. And I'll show you what I mean. But he's saying you can come with your beautiful offering of God, maybe thousands of sheep. But if you know there's somebody against you, you're supposed to fix that. So you can't say it's their problem. Not in God's economy of love and, and reconciliation and restoration. But so there's supposed to be a family and caring for one another. That is also in the law. And that obedience to God is more important. And again, this is not just about your anger towards others. It's theirs towards you. And there's so much in the New Testament, Romans 12, by the way, right, to be in peace with all men, as much as it's possible on your part. And there's so much more teachings in Peter also and the rest of Paul about uh, humility and dying to self and and the kind of love that's supposed to be others first. It shows that, yeah, if, if your brother, if your sister, that person has something against you, you're supposed to be reaching out and caring for them. So let's forget the altar for a moment and let's go to worship instead. When you sing God's praise and then he reminds you that, that that brother had a problem with you, remember? Yeah, 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 but I'm offering God praise and he's happy for that. No? According to Jesus, stop. Go fix it. That's more important to him. Like John, it says, how can you say you love God when you don't love his children, which you do see? This is how we bring it home to us. And this is where Jesus brings it all home and I would say kind of concludes it by saying, oh no, by adding one more thing. I'm sorry. He's adding one more thing. Uh, Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going to him with him to court. Least your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you will be put in prison. Does some think that Jesus is going and speaking about another subject? I don't think so. I think he's just still speaking about this idea of somebody has something against you. Reconcile it. He's just using another context where there's court involved and, and prison involved but he's still talking about the same idea. Somebody has something against you. Fix it. Actually, that expression, um, come to ter- terms, could mean you be restored to them, but them to you. It could go either way. But the idea is still make peace. Right? Either to, to humble yourself and do whatever you need to for them to forgive you, or to make sure that your heart is well before them and saying, let's do a problem. No, make peace. The body of Christ is a united front. So 
make peace so the body can function. And, and you see him again um, do some of that synonym, some of that repetition about you know the judge that goes to the guard and the guard puts you in prison. Um, kind of saying the same thing as we've seen before. There'll be, there'll be judgment for this. There'll be punishment for this. There'll be consequences. So get things resolved. This isn't just about your personal anger. He goes way further than that. You have to consider also other people and how they feel about you. And that's when he breaks it home. This is how he ends it. And we know he does because he'll say, truly, I say to you, here's my application. You will never get out until you have paid the last penny. Again, he's not talking about you being angry and having consequences for that. He's saying others are angry with you and you're not trying to resolve that. There'll be consequences. God's the ultimate king ruling over all of that. So it's, it's to him you'll have to pay the pennies. There's such a sense where even what Jesus teaches, not just what we see in the rest of the New Testament, calls us to have this um, reconciliation between ourselves within the family of God and the, the good intimacy, the good connection. Because if not, there's consequences with our relation with our Father. It, it could be among brothers and sisters or even in a couple, First Peter chapter 3. And make sure that everything's right with your wife or your prayers aren't going to be heard. It's, it's everywhere, like I said. And we need to take it seriously, your brothers and sisters. So yeah, this is where I believe Jesus goes with it. So we're definitely, our righteousness is not better than the Pharisees. I hope you, you got that. And you also understood where Jesus went with that. And how we still need to apply these things to our lives. And let's know, be blessed.